Right, hello everybody. Um, it's great to be here with you. And I thought what I'd do today is, um, while we're talking about psychoconservation, just give a brief overview of the legal um, protection afforded to them. So that when we say member, everybody knows what I mean by that. If we start saying BMPs, everyone understands the BMPs. So I am sorry, I know there's a, a lot of people with a wealth of experience in psych heads in, you know, in the room. Um, and I apologize if some of this is a bit repetitive, but I'd like everyone to kind of step forward on the same foot. Um, we'll also discuss the National Strategy and Action Plan um, and the work that's commenced on that. I'll be looking at the work that the EWT is specifically focusing between the BMP and the National um, Strategy and Action Plan. And um, Tommy and Willem will also be discussing um, their work in, in that area. So, without any further ado, when I say NIMBA, NIMBA is our um, Biodiversity Act. It's one of the specific environmental management acts that was promulgated under NEMA, which is our framework piece of environmental legislation. And what it does is it, it basically provides us with a foundation to do various biodiversity initiatives in the country. Specifically for our purposes today is to protect threatened and protected species. Um, from Moritz's presentation, you'll realize that we've got 38 cycads that are protected in South Africa, or at least that we've got them in South Africa as an indigenous species. And um, of the encephalitis species, all except ferox are nationally protected. While we're talking about national legislation, it's also important to remember that each province in South Africa has legislation that also affords protection. And Vesi will illustrate why that provincial legislation is so important as well. So there are debates as to why we still have provincial legislation, why when we've got national legislation, it does come in handy um, in instances where we've got psychiatric crimes. Right. Um, so NIMBA and, and CICADS, what NIMBA does, as I mentioned, is it provides us with a legal foundation to enforce CITES at the national level. Now CITES is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. It's a little bit of a mouthful, so we use the acronym CITES, and what that does is regulates international trade in, in species that are threatened by trade. All encephalitis species are Appendix 1, which means that commercial trade in any CICAD from South Africa is prohibited. Okay. Um, so remember, it affords us the, the power to regulate CITES at the national level because CITES is a convention. And um, it also allows us to regulate trade in threatened and protected species. And as I mentioned, um, CICADs are listed as that. Right. Um, now, according to Section 56 of NIMBA, and I'm sorry, it's a lawyer coming out in me, so please excuse the sections, but it makes me comfortable. <laughs> um, what NIMBA did is it allowed the Minister of Environmental Affairs the power to list threat species that they regarded as threatened or species that should be protected by virtue of the fact that they have an economic or national significance to South Africa. The elephant, for example. The elephant is a protected species not because it's currently threatened in South Africa, but because what is South Africa without elephants? You go to game reserves to see elephants. So it's protected by virtue of the fact that it's you know, on a, what is it, 10 rand note? 100 round notes? We need elephants. So um, I'll take you through the various listings of that. But um, <laughs> So what they did is, this is a, a legal classification. It's not the IUCN classification. And um, this list was published in 2007. Um, so it was a little bit ahead of some of the poaching that we've seen, but not as ahead of the mark from some other, other poaching. And you'll have realized there's been massive poaching over the last, what is it, 20, 30 years that has driven species almost to extinction, with some of our species li basically limited to less than 100 in the wild. So some of our species are, are facing imminent threats. Um, as I mentioned, all species are what we call tops listed, except for ferox. And what I've done is just highlighted what of our encephalitis species are in what category of the tops list. So our critically endangered species, we've used the IUCN um, basically definition of critically endangered. So when the lawyers talk about critically endangered and the scientists talk about critically endangered, we all know that it means that the species is facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the immediate term future. And these are the legally classified critically endangered species. Okay. 
I do mention or note that some, the, the science does sometimes overtake the law. It's a little bit easier for scientific publications to come out than it is to change promulgated legislation. So it might be that some of the species, that some species that are critically endangered are not legally critically endangered yet. Right, endangered species, again, that follows the scientific definition of endangered, which is that the species faces an extremely high risk of extinction in the immediate term future, but not as high a risk as critically endangered. And those are our endangered legally protected cycads. Our vulnerable cycads, these are the cycads that are facing an extreme, or extremely high risk of extinction in the medium term future. So they're kind of in the yellow category, not, not the flashing red category. And here are protected species. These are the elephants of the cycad world. They're protected by virtue of, of being nationally important to South Africa. Um, right, so why is this list so important? Again, the lawyer in me needs to quote some legislation. But what NIMBA says is that for you to conduct a restricted activity for any top listed species, you require a permit. And just to kind of enumerate some of the restricted activities, it includes, as a, one of my favorite prosecutors said, everything short of looking at a psychoad requires a permit. <laughs> so it's a nice little catch-all. <laughs> but um, any activity that, that you want to undertake with a psychoad, including pruning, technically requires a permit. So I get calls regularly by people that say, you know, their, their psychoads grow in suckers and they're just gonna take the sucker off and give it to their daughter. And I was like, you do realize you've just done the equivalent of poached Durano. <laughs> Okay, the, the law says that you're undertaking a restricted activity for a top of species. It is a legal offence. Okay, the law's pretty clear on that. Whether it'll get prosecuted as such is a different story. Um, but yeah, so you're, you're gathering, collecting, plucking. That specifically covers some of the activities that Mo spoke about. Um, you're importing and exporting. As I mentioned, CICADs are Appendix 1 of, CIC of CITES, so commercial trade in them is prohibited. Um, from wild cycads, all right? You are allowed to trade in artificially propagated cycads if you meet the necessary society standards. But you need a import and export permit to do so. All right, now those of you who understand the South African legislation will say, but if you need a CITES permit, do you need a TOPS permit? Mm. Yes. It's what you call an integrated permit and it will cover both the NIMBA legislation and the CITES legislation. So you'll be covered under both. Um, growing, breeding, or anywhere propagating. So all of your nurseries, for instance, need to have CITES uh, uh, perm uh, sorry, TOPS permits for the cycads that they've got. And here, as you're conveying, moving, or otherwise translocating, you move your cycad from one corner of your garden to the other. Technically, it requires a permit. <laughs> Whether that's enforceable is a different story. <laughs> but it certainly does cover you moving your cycad from one property to another, and it definitely covers your, you moving your cycad from one province to another. Okay. And if you move it out of the country again, you then go into your exporting. Um, you're selling or otherwise trading in and, and buying, receiving, giving. Basically, any way that you get the cycad or dispose of the cycad also requires a permit. So those are your restricted activities for any one of our top listed cycads. Now, what the minister is also empowered to do is, in addition to listing the species that are threatened or need of protection, she's also empowered to prohibit activities where she feels that those activities are going to impact the wild populations negatively. And this was done um, in terms of the prohibition notice that was published a couple of years ago now. Um, and what it does is basically divides your your prohibitions between your wild cycads and activities there and your artificially propagated cycads. So one needs to draw a clear distinction between what activities are prohibited for wild cycads and what activities are prohibited for artificially propagated ones. If you've got a wild cycad, you are absolutely prohibited from collecting, plucking, uprooting and destroying. Now if you think back to what Mo was speaking about earlier, one can start seeing that there are offences that are being committed, knowingly or not, um, it, it does become complicated when one's dealing with these kind of things, but it is prohibited. Um, exporting from the Republic, that's for wild cycads, and that ties in very nicely then with the society's obligations that we've got. Receiving, giving, donating, accepting, acquiring, or disposing, it is illegal and prohibited for you to acquire a wild cycad. Again, people will say, well, they didn't know. 
My question to you is, do you buy diamonds off people on the side of the road and expect them to be legal? There's a certain amount of consumer, um, I suppose, proactiveness that one needs to take as well to ensure that your activities aren't illegal. Right? When we buy cars, we make sure that the person that we buy the car from has the paperwork for the car. Why do we not do that with psychads? Okay. Something to keep in the back of your mind. <laughs> Um, it is illegal to import them into the Republic. Um, all right, there are other cycads, um, other encephalitis species that exist in the rest of Africa that aren't in South Africa, as well as possessing, exercising physical control over. What is interesting is under the restricted activities under NEMBA and the prohibited restricted activities, they don't mention ownership ones. What they do say is physical control. So if it's in your garden, if you're exercising physical control over it, whether you're the owner of the property or not, something to also to keep in mind if you're renting properties and things like that, you're exercising physical control over what may be illegal activities. Right. Um, right, so as I mentioned, one needs to make a clear division between your wild and your artificially propagated. If you look at the prohibited activities for artificially propagated cycads, um, it is prohibited to export cycads bigger than a certain size. Okay, now um, with our cycads, you've got dwarf species, and they take that into account when they do these sizes. So, anything, any cycad with a stem of more than 15 centimeters cannot be exported. And that was done to protect our wild cycads again. There are challenges that we have in once a cycad is out of the wild and in gardens, proving that it was out of the wild and in gardens. And I'm hoping your presentation will start. Um, giving some scientific assistance in that regard. Um, there are telltale signs that one can look for, the absence of tap roots, um, other interesting characteristics, but um, it is difficult. Um, so what they've done to protect illegal exports um, of cycads that may have got laundered through the system, so taken out of the wild, moved into nurseries, and then traded as if they were artificially propagated. They restricted the trade, international trade, of large cycads. Um, so that's 15 centimetres, except for the dwarf species, in which case it's 7 centimetres, and there are your dwarf species listed. But, as I mentioned, it is a legislative offence to undertake a restricted activity, or to be in contravention of the prohibit prohibitation... Mm. <laughs> that, um, that notice <laughs> that prohibits certain activities. Um, it's a legally prescribed offence, all right? The charge sheet's very simple. You get charged with um, being contravention of Section 101, read of Section 571, and you face up to 10 years imprisonment. Now, someone's going to say, sure, but you've been watching the media and you've seen murder convicts go for six to eight years, 10 years for a plant offence. Seems a little bit harsh. Not really, not when you've considered what most, what most discussed. And the nice thing is, is that in places like the Eastern Cape, we are seeing sentences of up to 10 years direct imprisonment for psycho offences. An even better thing is that they've got that confirmed by the High Court. So oftentimes what happens is, um, because of your court thresholds, um, psycho offences, actually wildlife offences generally, are prosecuted in the magistrate's court. That doesn't give us precedent, um, and those cases aren't reported. So what's happened in the Eastern Cape now is they had the, um, it got taken on appeal and the judge in that matter actually said that the sentence given by the magistrate court was too low for the crime that was committed. So we've now got a high court sentence in the Eastern Cape that confirms the minimum of 10 years for psychiatric offences, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'd be happy to, to get that and share that with people that are interested. So the nice thing is that the NPA, they're dedicated prosecutors, um, and that, that have really taken up the cause and prosecute psychiatric offences as if they were, well, as they, as they are serious crimes, priority crimes in South Africa. Um, so moving on to some of the other documents that have been, at least policies that have been developed under NIMBA. What the Minister is also empowered to do, in addition to making the prohibition notice, is she's allowed to make biodiversity management plans. And that's in terms of Section 43. And this has been done for the following species. I'm not going to read them all out there, but they, they are there. It's 11 critically endangered and 4 endangered species. And there's a BMP. They're, they're all included in one BMP. Um, thanks. Um, 
And what this BMP does is it, it first separates your general principles and general obligations and then gives specific initiatives per species. Um, so some of the, the general um, areas that the BMP covers is it gives you overarching principles and operational guidelines. And that's to, to cover all 15 cycad species. Then it's, it specifically wants to increase the protection of wild cycad populations from poaching. Okay. As was raised by Moritz, it's the biggest threat that our cycads are facing. Um, and that was taken into account. And under each of these initiatives, there's an objective, what they would like to see under that, and an action. So how does, what, what steps need to be taken to meet your objective, to meet your overall objective, which is to increase protection of wild cycads. It also um, calls for conducting essential research to ensure effective implementation. And that will include research into diseases, um, into species identification through DNA. So there's been a really nice initiative going through the University of Johannesburg where they've barcoded all, I think it's all 68 encephalitis species, all 68, yeah. So every single cycad that is endemic to the African continent has been barcoded, which means that when law enforcement and, um, investigators come across a cycad that's had its leaves cut off and it's just a little stem, they can take a sample, send it to the University of Johannesburg, and they can come back and say it is Encephalitis middlebergensis, for example. And that helps with getting your charges brought before a court much faster. Previously, they would have had to have planted them and hopefully waited for them to grow, and then brought in experts, and then identify the cycad, and then the charge sheet could have been brought. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's actually been really, really great in this field, seeing how science and law and government have all kind of come together to tackle this crime. Um, what is also called for is the effective management of confiscated cycads. Um, and that's, a, that's an ongoing issue. Oftentimes they are really damaged. Um, and you'll, you saw that from, from Bessie's um, pictures earlier, where the roots, basically the tapery's taken out and the cycads are broken and they, they don't often survive. Um, it also calls for the establishment, maintenance, and um, securing ex to gene back co um, collections of our critically endangered and endangered species. So I don't know if you sat through the previous presentation on climate change. So if there's a massive tidal wave, we don't lose all of our cycads in one go. <laughs> and um, as I mentioned, there's also specific, um, oh yeah, species-specific plans included in the BMP as well. Thank you. Um, I might run over just a little bit. <laughs> What's also been established recently um, over the last couple of years is a national strategy and action plan for the management of cycads. This was still in draft form when the BMP was published, but it specifically spoke to the action plan already. So there was this drive to get this action plan and these, this consolidated movement to get the initiatives and strategic objectives of the action plan through. And um, essentially, what its primary aim is to conserve and sustainably manage populations um, of all cycad species through the historic range in South Africa. Um, and the, the, the kind of cutoff date is 2020 for most of the initiatives. I think some of them go a little bit beyond that. But what, is the, what the national plan does is it divides its objectives into six objectives. Um, so you'll have objectives that deal with security, with population management, um, with habitat management. Why is it not going? Oh. Um, with sustainable use. And sorry, it's not going as fast as I want to talk. <laughs> uh, with communication, education, public awareness. And I've highlighted this specifically because under this was an activity to develop and conduct cycad identification training to law enforcement officials, magistrates and prosecutors. And this is one of the initiatives that we developed last year. We piloted the training program. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity now to thank Tommy and Willem who were instrumental in this training program. It couldn't have been done without them. Um, to train law enforcement officials. Now, oftentimes what happens is, um, and Mo alluded to it earlier, you've got people that are really in the know in the cycad business and they know exactly what they want, and they have these beautiful collections, and oftentimes can out-talk law enforcement officials about what the CICAD is. Um, what that has allowed is laundering of illegal CICADs onto the market. 
So what we've done is we've started this, this training program to deal with identification and then to build on those skills to tackle psychiatric crimes in general. So I've given just a brief overview of some of the activities that take place under this training. Um, we introduce law enforcement officials to psychiatrists. All right, it's not the, it's basically the rhino of the plant world, but um, it's getting people off the blinkered approach that we have to to wildlife crimes and try to try and focus that attention to more species. Uh, we'll discuss the legislation protecting psychiatrists, um, go through some terminology. And then the bulk of the training for the first couple of interventions is identification. And I've had these wide-eyed looks of horror when these guys have to come through to try and identify these words and they have to use a, basically Greek <laughs> to, to try and get their tongues around the terminology and all of that. Um, but what we've done is, this is a, a five-week training course spread over. So what I've highlighted there is where we moved around the country under this course last year. And by the end of the fifth week, and it took place over about a six-month, eight-month period, we, we had a group of enforcement officials from across the country that were dedicated to tackling psychiatric crimes. Um, Bessie is one of them, and I'm absolutely thrilled that he's here. Um, but yeah, it's really it's brought in a new, new group of psychiatric law enforcement officials, guys that are constantly on WhatsApp and um, discussing issues and events and, and um, things that are happening in the areas. What we've also developed um, that speaks to, to that initiative under the, the national strategy is a lot of awareness raising material. So that poster was developed a couple of years ago. We also have a website. And that Wildlife Crime Handbook has a dedicated chapter on psychiatrists for prosecutors. And included in that book is charge sheets and motivations why one should tackle psychiatric crimes as priority crimes. We've also developed a PSYCAD law enforcement toolkit, and that gets given to each of our, our participants as well. So, um, and we've also been very fortunate that we've got funding for the next lot of advanced training, and this is the, the new guys that are carrying the torch for this year. Does anybody have any questions on legislation? I know it's like a high-speed recap and a lot of the sections and, and all of that.